Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it wouldn't take a genius to figure out that uh, church today looks just a little different than what it looked like one week ago. Obviously, last Sunday was Easter, and so what sort of differences do we see today? Well, obviously, there aren't as many people in church this morning. Visitors from out of town, visitors from our community, uh, there aren't as many of those people today. We also look at the beautiful Easter flowers, and while we still have some Easter flowers around, many of those flowers have been taken home by people. And I would also guess and imagine that uh, the singing today probably wasn't quite as loud as it was uh, one week ago on Easter Sunday. I don't think that's a surprise to anyone. That Easter Sunday is uh, one of the most joyful, one of the most anticipated uh, Sundays within uh, the church year. Uh, there's so much excitement on Easter Sunday. And then what usually ends up happening is that excitement slowly fades away over the next few weeks. That's actually not an uncommon thing when it comes to our faith. Has that ever happened to you, that, that one day your faith seems to be really strong, there's a lot of joy, there's a lot of excitement, and then, and then it starts getting less and less and less. Maybe it happened this past week, that you came here on Easter Sunday and there was a lot of joy and excitement and you couldn't wait uh, to sing, but then this week you got back to reality. Spring break, Easter break is over. You had to go back to work, go back to school. You realize that the problems you weren't really thinking about last weekend are problems you're going to have to deal with today. And you remember that long list of things that you need to get done over the next few weeks. Our Easter joy sometimes can get less and less and less. But today in our lesson from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul reminds us of an important truth. That Easter is not just a once a year celebration, but Easter is something to celebrate every day. And so today in our sermon, we'll see why you and I can enjoy Easter every single day. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is all about the importance of Jesus' physical, bodily resurrection from the dead. And in our section for today, Paul starts off by throwing out a hypothetical situation. What if Jesus didn't rise from the dead? He says, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. See, there were some within this Corinthian congregation that said there is no such thing as a resurrection from the dead. And Paul says if that's true, then there's no way that Christ would have been raised back to life either. Sadly, still today, there are some churches that call themselves Christian that deny Jesus' physical resurrection from the dead. It's just too hard to believe. And so what happens to the Bible then? Well, the Bible ends up being this story, this old story about God's love for us, this old story about how to live life in this world but as far as miracles like Jesus rising from the dead, for some it's just too hard to believe. And so Paul takes some time in these verses and he explains the reliability and the trustworthiness of the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. The Lord has given you and me four gospel accounts that in great detail describe what happened on Easter morning talking about all of the different people that Jesus appeared to. Not just his disciples, but those women at the tomb and a few other followers as well. In addition to that, the Apostle Paul, right before our lesson, makes this point, that Jesus was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. 
After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. So Paul's saying this. He's talking to the Corinthian Christians and he says, if you want proof that Jesus rose from the dead, I've got 500 people who have seen Jesus alive. A person's fate in a court case may be decided by one or two key witnesses. Well, Jesus' resurrection from the dead has over 500 eyewitnesses. It's reliable. It's trustworthy. It's not a crazy thing to believe. That's what Paul's getting at. So, why is this so important then? Well, Paul goes on and explains why Jesus' resurrection from the dead matters so much. What he says next is this. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins, and we are to be pitied more than all men. If Christ did not rise from the dead, you'd have better things to do this Sunday morning. If Christ did not rise from the dead, it would have been better for you just to sleep in. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, we might as well just close up shop here. Our church and our school, our new fellowship hall, would be completely meaningless if Christ did not rise from the dead. Why? Paul says because you would still be in your sins. Your faith would be futile. Because if Jesus didn't rise from the dead... All that the Bible talks about is this guy who lived a pretty good life, a, a guy who said some pretty crazy things along the way, uh, a guy who maybe taught us how to live a little bit, and that would be it. That when Jesus would have died on Good Friday, there is no way those, that payment could have been for our sins if Christ remained in the grave. But then Paul goes on and explains why Jesus' resurrection matters so much. He says, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Christ's death and resurrection, they are the heart and core of the Christian faith. Without those events happening, there is no Christian faith. Because Jesus' resurrection from the dead tells us some pretty wonderful things. In our lesson, we see two things that Jesus' resurrection from the dead tells us. The first one is this. Easter tells us that our sins are forgiven. Now maybe you're thinking, well, I thought Jesus died for our sins on Good Friday, so what does Easter have to do with our sins and God's forgiveness for our sins? Well, Paul says if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, the sacrifice that Jesus made on Good Friday would not have mattered. It would not have been able to take away our sins, not at all. But when Jesus rose from the dead, it was proof. Uh, proof that God accepted Jesus' payment for our sins on Good Friday when he died. Proof that God put his stamp of approval on Jesus' saving work. You can think of it like this. When Jesus was on the cross on Good Friday and he said those words, it is finished, it was as if Jesus was writing a check for our salvation and then on Easter Sunday when Jesus rose, that was proof that that check cleared. That God accepted Jesus' payment for every one of your sins. And so enjoy Easter every single day because it tells you that God has removed every single one of your sins. The next reason why Easter matters so much is something we see Paul talk about at the end of our lesson. He says this, calls Jesus the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. You might wonder what that means. Well, the farmers here today might have a better understanding of this picture. Farming takes a lot of hard work, a lot of time, and a lot of energy, and it also requires a lot of patience. Uh, when farmers plant the seed, you wait and you hope. Uh, you hope that it rains, but you hope that it doesn't rain too much. Uh, you hope that it doesn't get too hot, but you also hope that it doesn't get too uh, cold. And what ends up happening eventually is that the seed sprouts and grows, and then you notice that 
hey, there's something coming out of the ground, and pretty soon you see the first fruits of the harvest. And that's an important sign because it tells those farmers that the rest of the harvest will follow. So apply that to Jesus and his resurrection from the dead. He says, Jesus is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Jesus faced death head on, and he won. And because he lives and because he rose from the dead, that tells us that the rest of the harvest, you and me, will follow. Paul says, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Right now, those souls of believers who have passed away are in heaven. But one day, on Judgment Day, Jesus will return, and he will raise our lifeless bodies. And just like a farmer can relax just a little bit when he notices the first fruits coming up out of the ground, so we can relax too. When we face death, when we think about death, we can look at Jesus' resurrection, the first fruits, and know that we will follow him too. Lori and I lived in Las Vegas during my vicar year. And one neat thing about Las Vegas is there are a lot of things to do outside of the town. Uh, national parks within driving distance, a lot of great hiking, a lot of great places uh, to see. There's one place about 10 minutes outside of Las Vegas called Red Rock Canyon. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really brown, it's really dry, but there's a lot of neat rock formations and a lot of great hiking there. Well, one day, a few weeks before Easter, Lori and I were hiking there, and we came across this valley. And in the middle of this valley, there were all sorts of trees uh, that were very brown and lifeless. They, they looked like they were dead. But then right in the middle of this section of trees, there was one tree that was completely green. Uh, it was alive. See, some of the snow from a nearby mountain had, had melted and gave life to this one tree. It was, it was quite the sight to see. All of these dead trees, and right in the middle, there was one tree that was alive. A few weeks after that, we went back to that same place, and uh, we went hiking, and we went into that valley, and what did we notice there? It wasn't just one tree that was green now. But all of those other trees, those brown, dead, lifeless trees, they were now green and alive too. See, more snow had melted from that mountain, and it gave life to all of those trees in the valley. When the Bible calls Jesus the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, that's a similar picture. Jesus is like that very first tree that was alive. And what does Jesus' resurrection tell us? That we will live too, and that we will follow him. And what's really neat about that is something that the Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 3. It says that Jesus will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. See, when Jesus rose from the dead, he rose so that he wouldn't die again. When Jesus rose from the dead, he didn't rise to a life feeling the effects of living in a sinful world. Jesus rose with a perfect, glorified body that no longer felt the effects of sin. And because you are connected to Jesus through faith, one day he's going to do the same thing for you. That he will give you a perfect body. One that won't get tired one that won't get sick, one that won't wear out, one that won't get cancer, one that won't need to go to the hospital, one that won't have heart problems or kidney problems or liver problems or any sort of the problems that we face in this world. But Jesus on Judgment Day will give you a perfect, glorified body that will have none of the effects of living in this sinful world. So enjoy Easter every single day because Jesus will give you life, a perfect life in heaven. 
So yeah, Easter is over. Most of the flowers, uh, they're gone. The Easter candy, that's been eaten too, at least at, at my house. People have come and gone, but the blessings that Jesus has won for us through his life, through his death, and through his resurrection, those things will never end. Your sins are forgiven. Heaven is your home. One day Jesus will give you a perfect body. Rejoice in that. Share that. And enjoy Easter every single day. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Please stand.